Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and a rare Sunday show. And this is concluding, at least temporarily, our Pacific week. The show with Ryan Lowry that was meant to be yesterday, I've temporarily put it on next Saturday, but he's got some issues he's having to take care of, but I will reschedule that as soon as I can. By the way, tomorrow we start a week of what I call Moments in History, which means I couldn't think of a better title for a, a random selection of shows. We're looking at Nazi leaders with Michael Miller tomorrow. We've got some great content coming your way. But today... To finish off our Pacific week, I'm joined by Sarah Levy, who runs History Behind the Page on Instagram. Link is in the description below. And she'll be giving us 10 facts about the USS, USS, nearly gave too many S's there, Indianapolis, which is the story, of course, you may have seen on Twitter. I mentioned the incredible speech by Robert Shaw in, in Jaws. But the only mention of sharks, unless you guys mention it in your question, is going to be now. That is, that's, we've done sharks now, and now we're going to go on to the rest of the history of the ship. So, Good morning where you are. Good morning, Sarah. How are you today? I'm good, Paul. How are you? I'm very well. So first thing is, for those who don't know what you do, tell us about your Instagram channel and the YouTube channel and what it is you're trying to do and who you speak to. Yeah, so I run, um, I am the History Trick 1941 on Instagram and YouTube and also semi-Facebook. Um, I uh, specialize in military history, specifically from World War II through the War on Terror. And I just love to share history, find different things. I'm learning along with interesting things with my followers too as well. And if I, if I find anything interesting, I want to share it. Um, I like to make my learning interactive so I get those people who aren't fully into history to get in there and hopefully go on those rabbit holes. Um, and then I run a live series on Instagram called History Behind the Page. It's a live series where you get to know more about people behind all of your favorite um, history content, you know, content creators, authors, actors. I've had you on, Paul. I had you on a year ago, actually. <laughs> so, it's a long time. Yeah, it seems like ages. I know. I know. It's crazy. And so it's just a, a chat and getting to know people. It's a live Q&A, too, as well. I do it live on Instagram, and then it goes on Instagram and also on my YouTube channel, too. I've had some amazing guests on there, but I, I kind of started the show in more of a selfish way because I wanted to ask people questions without being creepy. <laughs> 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 ask ask their I like to know their why. Like, why are you into history? What got you started? What is your favorite topic? And then People can ask questions too, and it's been really great. So I absolutely love doing history behind it. And, and everything you do on Instagram, what I like about it is that you, you're giving people, as you said there, that entry level, but with also some depth of knowledge behind it as well. Because some of the channels, my own channel included, can be if you suddenly discover it and you're just getting into World War II history, it's, my God, this is complicated. Oh my, are they going into so mm -hmm. much detail? I don't know where I am with this. What theater are we talking about there? For a lot of people there, you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start somewhere where you can just ease people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what you're doing. And you're using all these wonderful social media um, <laughs> um, accounts that I don't use. And I mean, Instagram mag runs my Instagram account for me, really, because I try and stick to being on YouTube. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, we're, 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 um, we're going to carry on with the show. So you've got your PowerPoint now. So I'll bring it up on screen. I'm in charge of it. So, folks, if you've got questions for Sarah, then please... Um, Please far away, but um, we're going to start over with 10 things you should know about the USS Indianapolis. So over to you, Sarah. So um, I kind of wanted to focus. Everybody knows the story of the USS Indianapolis and the sinking and the men in the water and uh, the, the rescue and everything. I wanted to do a couple facts about what she was prior to yep. what she's most known for, because she was a powerhouse in the Pacific. So I have some notes right here. So if I glance off screen, um, I swear I'm paying attention. But um, before she sank, um, she was part of a huge island hopping campaign. She was part of the New Guinea and Aleutian Island campaign. She bombarded Peleliu prior, uh, before and after. She did the pre-invasion bombing of Okinawa. Uh, she was part of the invasion of the Gilbert Islands. Uh, she bombarded Tarawa. She did the attack on Tinian where she attacked uh, shore installations. Um, she was also Ad Admiral Spruance's flagship for his fifth fleet. So she was a huge deal. So a lot of people don't know about what she went through, uh, you know, before the sinking. That's what everybody knows her as. And with the Battle of Okinawa, uh, the pre-invasion bombardments, that's actually uh, where she went under a kamikaze attack and actually created the whole roller coaster of events that created the sinking. So a kamikaze crashed into the Indy and 
dropped the bomb that it had and it exploded and it killed nine men and tore two holes in the in the boat and then she had to get towed back to harbor and then that's the beginning of the end for the Indy. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting about how much she had been in the Pacific prior to what everybody knows her for. No, definitely. And as we were talking before going live, it's, you know, another question I'm going to ask you is with, with the fame of the shark incident. And, you know, if, if you haven't seen that speech in Jaws and, and Robert Shaw wrote that himself and the Broadway play about how the Jaws was made is touring right now. And Ian Shaw, Robert Shaw's son plays his father. And they talk about how that speech came about and Robert Shaw blo- wrote it and they got black eyes, like dolls eyes, all that stuff, that fame that that story brought the Indianapolis as someone your self-confessed fan of the indie does that do more harm or more good for people when they want to understand the history so the speech in jaws actually helped the story of the indie come to light it was one of the most amazing things ever because that actually started the roller coaster of the men of the indie still trying to get their captain um, exonerated Um, It started, people didn't know about the indie at that time when Jaws came out. So I think that helps if it's done correctly in movies and film. If it's, if it's not, um, then it can be harmful because people will get a certain notion in their head and just go off the movie and not do their own research um, and hear the story. So, but I think the, the speech in Jaws definitely was a good thing for the indie. It catapulted yeah. everything. No, definitely, and uh, and a great speech. So anyway, mm-hmm. back back to you for that. So 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 fact nut one is Gus is just how many things the Indianapolis had done before the famous story. Mm-hmm. And then for the next slide, um, she actually has uh, for as impressive like everything that I talked about earlier, all the campaigns and battles she was a part of. She actually has ten battle stars, which that's a, a big deal for. A, sh- a ship. So um, I can never remember these off the top of my head. So I am going to read them. So she has uh, 10 battle stars from the Bougainville Air Raid, the Aluations uh, Islands, the Gilbert Islands, the Marshall Islands. And I'm so sorry if I pronounce this wrong, but it's the Asiatic Pacific Raids, uh, the Mariana Operations, the Capture of Tinian, the Western Carolina Islands, uh, Iwo Jima um, Operations, and the Okinawa Operations. So 10 battle stars. She did a lot in the Pacific before the, meeting her tragic fate. So she, you know, she was she was kind of a badass. So yeah, and, and, and you know, we, we've talked about it a lot. I'm going down another potential rabbit hole. We've talked a lot recently with Trent Hone and others about aircraft carriers and battleships, mm-hmm. and often people measure the Pacific campaign by the massive great engagements and carrier battles are the ones that draw people. There's this whole fleet. Of, of smaller vessels, cruisers and destroyers, and all the just mm-hmm. countless transports that are going back and forth across the Pacific, enabling that island hopping campaign to go to, 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 to occur. And the Indianapolis is one of those ships that's just there all the time without necessarily ever getting the headlines, as so many ships were, just doing their bit, part of bombardment f- fleets, part of uh, support fleets off the off these islands, just doing mm-hmm. their, their, their stuff all the way through, but never, re- I say, never really kind of getting that headline until until the tragedy, of course. Yeah, 100%. You hear about the destroyers all the time and the aircraft carriers and all this. The cruisers are just like, hey, what's up? Pew, pew. Okay, bye. You know, like, <laughs> and they're they're literally just everywhere. And they are the they are a huge support system. Um, when you have campaigns like that, like the the bombardments of Okinawa and stuff like that, so um, they're they're definitely a little bit of an underdog when it comes to ships. Absolutely, in yeah. in my personal opinion. Well, it, it, it's shared by me, so um, yeah. Well, let, let's keep going. We're we're loving it so far. All right, next slide. So everybody knows that the USS Indianapolis was carrying key components of the atomic bomb to uh, the island of Tinian. What they don't know is how close it was from when the Trinity test happened to when it went on the ship and went on its voyage. So the Trinity test happened at 529 in the morning on July 16th, 1945. The Indy left San Francisco, July 16th, 1945, four hours after the Trinity test happened. So that's how they did the Trinity test. They saw it and they're like, the Indy, we gotta get this on the Indy, we gotta get it. They made it in record time to Tinian with no problem. Um, but it's it's crazy how people don't know how much 
the Trinity test and how close and coincide they are besides them, you know, carrying the key components. But I thought that was uh, pretty cool. I didn't realize yeah. how close, I didn't realize how close it was. And it also just, you know, it, it adds this idea. There's a ship that's been doing a fairly similar role for years. And then suddenly it's given this kind of vital courier mission at the last minute that, that we now know uh, allowed the world to enter a new phase of, of, of the nuclear era. But there's a ship that's suddenly been given this task. Do mm -hmm. we have any idea of kind of how, whether the crew had been given and the command had been given any kind of clue before this, this was going to happen? Or is, you know, you say they, they, it had been damaged in the kamikaze attack. It just happened to be mm -hmm. the available ship. Is that as simple as that? I think it, it was it was specifically picked, um, ki kind of specifically picked, but it was, it was available, you know, it was a little bit more available. It finally just got out of um, getting fixed down in San Francisco. But um Nobody knew what was in the package, not even Captain McVeigh. Uh, Captain McVeigh was clued in that it was very top secret, but yep. he was not able to know anything, um, which is actually going to go into my next, <laughs> mm. my next, my next thing. <laughs> so yeah, nobody knew what was on the ship um, at all, including the captain. And I think that if Captain McVeigh knew the cargo that he was carrying, he would have pushed more for escorts. Um, but that's a whole other story about why there were no uh, escorts. Um, and we can maybe get into that later it. on. But um, but yeah, yeah. So so four hour turnaround. What a, that is the amazing fact that I, I have to say I didn't know that one. That that's good. So I'm moving on. Next slide. Next slide. And so this goes into that nobody knew. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of bets on what was in the package that was bolted down. Um, the top secret package that was under, you know, two guards. Um, they all thought they had a bet going that it was 2000 rolls of scented toilet paper for General MacArthur. That's what <laughs> all the guys had a huge bet. That's what they thought was in the <laughs> top. I mean, they didn't seriously think that, but they had, it was a huge bet on the ship, that that's what it was. So given, given what we know about MacArthur, it's not that far <laughs> from, from yeah. being believable, you know, from scented toilet paper. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 stupid enough without being so stupid you just dismiss it instantly. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's um, and we love it when MacArthur comes up because instantly the sidebar starts going. He was great. He was awful because he divides people straight down the middle. But um, yeah, um, yeah, I didn't know that one. Yeah, and a lot of guys on the ship they were uh, you know, like young, young. They were like seventeen, eighteen, nineteen year olds. A lot of them, you know were were that age and so of course they'd be like it's probably scented toilet paper <laughs> wow so uh for the next slide so everybody knows the sinking but i don't people th realize how fast it sank um from the moment the first torpedo hit so there were six torpedoes launched from the i-58 they were type 2 95 torpedoes two out of the six hit by the time the first torpedo hit the ship sank in 12 minutes. So people think 12 minutes is a long time, but it actually isn't. If you think from when the first torpedo hit and did the uh, hitting the, the bow of the ship and causing a massive explosion and all the confusion and all that stuff, it sank so fast that men walked off the ship into the water. Just like you were walking from the beach into the ocean, they just walked off the ship into the water. That's how fast it sank. Wow. Yeah, and, uh, it was <laughs> it was just so crazy. Yeah. Um how fast it sank. Um yeah. so we can go to the next slide. So the majority of the men who perished in the water and passed away from the result of the Indianapolis actually died of mostly dehydration, sun exposure saltwater poisoning. A lot of them were covered in oil from the explosion of the Indy. Um, a lot of them also had excessive burns, cuts, injuries, which also they succumbed to those two as well, just naturally from those injuries. So that is actually the majority of most of the men who perished in the water. Um, and with saltwater poisoning, sun exposure, they were um, delusional they were yeah. seeing things they were exhausted so a majority of it was from uh drowning from results of other elements so that is actually the majority of the men who passed away in the water 
And do we know when the sort of the shark story became part of the narrative? Um, was it immediate at the time, or was it a post-war construction? No, it wasn't. It wasn't a post-war construction. It, it ha when they were talking to the survivors after they they pulled them and were getting accounts, they were talking about the sharks then. So it, it didn't happen. It wasn't a after the fact type of thing. Um, the one thing I will talk about shit about the sharks. You said we weren't going to do it, but we've we've, we've broken I, our rule just, already. But I fine. know. Just just one little little thing. The the sharks were so close that men were like walking on their backs in the water. That's the one thing I'll say about sharks. I'm not going to do anything else. <laughs> wow. No, it's crazy. And 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 you know, it it just goes to say show that I mean, if it, when survivors, the, the, there were survivors, not many, but there were survivors. And as you said, they're, they're dealing with dehydration, uh, hunger, exposure, mm -hmm. uh, all, all that. Meant. But you can imagine that the one thing that would have been really seared into their brain is shark fins. Because like yeah. man, human, I know we're mentioning sharks again, but man has an inherent fear of things like that. Whereas you don't kind of go through life with a fear of exposure. Exposure is is a obviously is a more more of a killer, but it's not something you kind of feel creeping up on you. Whereas shark mm -hmm. fins in the water, you can understand where the the fear and where this story built from is that men would have been talking about that, uh, even though, as you said, it wasn't the big killer of them. It would be the mm -hmm. one that, that 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 they 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 registered with and and were talking about. I'm guessing. Yeah, I mean that would register with me if I was in that, you know, situation too. <laughs> so yeah. it would be a, a big thing. Um we can go to the next slide. Yep. So one of the main reasons why the indie was erased from the board, a lot of people know that there was a SOS that was sent out through SOS messages, those were, and they thought that that's the reason that got erased from the board. When in actuality, the commanders of the Marianas and the Philippines kept operation boards of, of where the Indy was supposed to be after departing Guam. Um, she she dropped the bomb off at Tinian, went to Guam to refuel and all that stuff. And then she was going to go meet up with Task Force 95 to go do training operations for what they thought was the inevitable invasion of Japan. Yeah. So <clears throat> they tracked, McVeigh gave them parameters. He goes, this is how fast I'm going to be going. This is where I'm going to be. So they had operation boards and it's not uncommon for a, sh a ship on a top secret mission to not check in. Um, so they weren't, and also they didn't want to open the communication channels to let uh, the Japanese know where the India was at. So they followed these operation boards. And by the time the India got erased from the board, they were like, okay, she should be here right now, even though she hasn't checked in. Okay, she should be here right now, even though she hasn't checked in. All right, this this moment right here, she should be in the Philippine Sea, which is the line they should have crossed, and then they erased her off the board. So that is kind of how she got erased off the board um, in a command center sense. So, so just an assumption that almost like no news is good news in this case that that should be there and. And you know when when you look at this story, and you know I did a bit of prep for this as you have, then it's just a favorite story of yours. It, this the the story about the the loss. It's one of those kind of perfect storms, pardon the pun, of just a bit of bad luck and miscommunication and misunderstandings, and 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 so much um, focus on the, the the mission of the atomic bomb that you can you can see the you can see what happened and why it happened. But it, and it's just unfortunate, isn't it? It, it is unfortunate. It was, it was a lot of miscommunication. It was a lot of uh, negligence. Um, you know, the higher ups were like, the war is almost over, which it, it was, it ended two weeks later, but you know, they kind of got a little late, not lazy is not what I want to say, but I, I think everybody at that point in the war was so over the war and so war tired and just, you know, just wanted to get the stuff done so there was just a lack of communication and 
It, it, it's come up on the so. channel in other t occasions is that you, you, and it's hard to find the right words. I'm with you. Lazy isn't the right word. Cautious, you know, over uh, overconfident isn't quite the right word. War weary definitely is kind of the right word. But there's if you're an American serviceman in the Pacific at this point of the war, you are seeing we've talked about it recently with John McManus and Trent. And you're seeing so many ships and so many aircraft and so many people. And you're seeing a Japanese nation that is that is more or less at its end, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's still, there's still obviously going to be a bit more fighting to go, but your confidence is, is through the roof. You're feeling you're part of an almost unstoppable giant machine now that is just going to go on to an inevitable victory. And I suppose this, this type of thing happening is bucking that trend. It's, it's an unfortunate, terrible, tragic accident, but you can understand mm -hmm. among the fleet why there is this sense of everything's going very well right now. Yeah. And, you know, also, I think they were also dreading, you know, they didn't want to invade Japan. Nobody wanted to invade Japan. They didn't want to, they wanted the war to end. And so I think um, they kind of got a little, uh, what is the word? All the words I'm thinking of are just going to come out and sound wrong. But I think people were getting a little bit kind of like what you were saying. They thought they were unstoppable. So they kind of put their guard down a little bit and were like, yeah. we got this, we got this, you know, um, we don't need to be as cautious. Yeah, Take no, I think that's it. It's, yeah, it's, it's hard to find the right words, but it, you know, and we haven't been in that situation of 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 the being part of this enormous force. But I think that's what it is. But um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so next slide. Oh, Captain Charles McVeigh. Captain McVeigh was the only captain in history to be court-martialed over the loss of a ship. Um, he there was about a somewhere between 350 and 380, I think it's closer to 380, ships that were lost in World War II. He is the only captain to ever be court-martialed for that, which is insane. And the reason why is because the higher-ups were like, oh, crap, we messed up. Um, and one of the reasons he got court-martialed was obviously for negligence and loss of a ship, but also failing to zigzag and call abandoned ship in a timely manner which McVeigh, prior to going on his uh, the mission to drop off the key components of the atomic bomb, he was given uh, instructions that he doesn't, because there were no enemy subs in the water, um, he didn't technically have to zigzag and he could do uh, maneuvers at his discretion. Yeah. So um, that's kind of messed up. So he, he did zigzag uh, throughout the you know, going from uh, Guam to the Philippine Sea. He did, but on the night that they got attacked, they, uh, you know, lightened up on the zigzag maneuvers. And that's, um, but uh, that actually doesn't matter because uh, we'll go into that later. Anyways. <laughs> I mean, it, so, yeah, yeah. We, we, it, it, it is whenever you read and you're going to give people a list of, re of reading recommendations at the end of the show. But yes. Whenever you read about McVeigh, he, he just see He's just a victim. I mean, of, of the system and the tragedy. And you know, this you said it yourself earlier. This is a unique mission. There's nothing else like this. There's a ship mm -hmm. that's been doing its same role more or less for X number of years. Now suddenly it's been given this mission that's top secret, which is one complicating factor. It's got to be fast. The, the 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 efficiency of it is is important. Uh, it's different. It's going on, and it, and yet. And he's given these, these instructions that, you know, he doesn't have to zigzag, blah, blah, blah. And then he is found guilty of something that isn't even, it's just, it's a crazy story. And, it, yeah. and I'm sure you'll explain, but it took decades for him to be reevaluated. Yes. So, um, yes, out of all the convictions um, that he had, uh, the one he was convicted of was failing to zigzag, um, <laughs> which is so silly. Um but all the other ones got dropped. And actually the main witness for the prosecution, which this actually kind of backfired on them was commander Hashimoto of the I 58, the submarine right. that sunk the Indianapolis. So he said it, he testified that it didn't matter if he zigzagged or not, if he was zigzagging, um, he still would have sh uh, sunk the, the Indy. So, um, it just, they, they just needed something, uh, they needed to blame somebody and McVeigh was uh, that person. And he took his punishment with uh, strides and he was very humble about it. And um, he was a very great man, very great man. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the dignity he he showed with this because he could have got all petulant and angry and and try to incriminate others. But he he was to me the consummate commander in that he he definitely didn't want his crew to to get any of the blame, and so he he, he kind of accepted that him being the full guy was necessary, even if he, you know, he maintained his innocence. It was a, it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant, albeit tragic story of, of how to, how to command mm-hmm. men, how to, how to go in through life, accepting that responsibility that he is, he is the name at the top of the list. It is his ship. Therefore, whatever happens is his responsibility, even if it's not his fault. Mm-hmm. It's, I know. And even none of his men blamed him either. So yeah. it, it's just, which kind of goes, which goes into my next uh, slide. Which, there we go. Oh, wait. Hold on, click ahead one more. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, after his conviction, um, for years and years and years up until his death, he received phone calls, mail, Christmas cards, Everything from the families of the men who didn't survive, he was getting harassed. He would get cards like, I hope you're having a Merry Christmas. Ours would be much more merrier if you hadn't killed our son. So because of that, because of that guilty verdict, the men who didn't make it home, their families blamed him because the Navy said it was his fault. Because even though he didn't get convicted of failing to call abandoned ship in time mm-hmm. and, and negligence and all this other stuff, it still was in their minds. It was in those families' minds. They're like, he was, you know, they brought these charges against him, even though he wasn't found guilty of them. They, you still have that notion in the back of your mind. So it's, it's, for the, years, it's the, once you've been to trial, even if you're yeah. found innocent or not guilty, there's still that suspicion people have of, well, why was it, 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 you know, we see it all the time in 2023 with news stories is that once yeah. someone's been to court, that's it. They're, they're, the public of the public of decide, the public have made a decision. And it also examines what grief does. I mean, I'm going down a tangent of Woody's rabbit hole, but I remember the story, Major Howard, who led the gliders at Pegasus Bridge and Brother Ridge, mm-hmm. the lieutenant, was the first officer killed in the ta- in the in the mission across the bridge there and and brother ridge's widow kind of blamed howard for her husband's loss and it you know it was Mm -hmm. it was war but that that focus a grieving family member had on someone being responsible and in your case in, in this case as you said he was found guilty of one of these charges and therefore for these these families who are going through the process of grieving and and grieving a horrible loss you know knowing that your son or husband died you know, in in water of exposure, and 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 it's it's a horrible way to go. And then I can understand, although don't empathise with their their reasoning for putting McVeigh as the as the the figure of hate. But it's horrible. It's just awful. It is, and grief does so much to people. Um, they can um you know do a lot of anger, a lot of sadness, and they can hold on to that because you know they they lost a loved one. Um, McVeigh actually kept all of the letters and all of the cards, all of the Christmas cards that he received from family members of loved ones um, that were, that were lost. And he carried around a lot of guilt for that, um, that he lost these men, even though he he had no real control over it. He, they mm. got, they got torpedoed. Um, and with with the guilt of that, the loneliness of um losing his his dear wife and just the amount of sadness stress and depression from the events of the indianapolis uh captain mcveigh actually committed suicide on november 6th 1968 at the age of 70. i mean it, it, you know people who didn't know that it is just tragic and he would have had survivor's guilt you would assume even if he hadn't been found at fault for anything because of just the fact that you know, think of the Titanic, the captain in theory should go down with the ship. I mean, I don't mm-hmm. believe that, but that's kind of tradition suggests that and he's and he survived anyway. But and then to actually be found responsible on some level for this, and then be reminded, as you said, there by family members for decades. I mean, the I the sympathy and empathy I have for that poor guy's next 50, 50 even even if I'm gonna go, even if he had been at fault. No one mm-hmm. deserves that amount of harassment and that amount of, you know, because it, 
people, you know what, folks? People make mistakes and errors in war. That's how wars are won by the side that makes the least of mistakes. And every commander, uh, every, any level from corporal up to field marshal makes mistakes and errors of judgment. And I don't think he did in this case. But to be, to be, to be found, you know, consistently reminded of that for the rest of his life is just awful. Yeah, he had, I mean, he had survivor's guilt throughout his whole time. And, and one of the biggest, he, one of the biggest things that made him the most upset and sad during the trial was not that he was convicted of failing to zigzag. He was so upset that the court never mentioned the men of the Indy and those who did not survive. He was so upset. He was wow. so upset about that. Um, all right, we'll do the next slide. I think this is absolutely amazing. On August 17th of 2017, Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft and the uh, research ve vessel Petrol, discovered the USS Indianapolis 18,000 feet below sea level. Um, and they have a whole documentary on it called The USS, The Final Chapter through PBS, um, where they they didn't know when they were filming this documentary that they were going to find the Indy. They've been looking for the Indy for a while. But um, yeah, they found her uh, final resting place. Um, and you can go on YouTube and, and see, you know, the, the videos of it, or you can watch the, the documentary on PBS. But um, they had been searching for the Indianapolis for years, not just Paul Allen, but so many other people um because they they knew where the indy went down but not not really so yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. amazing it's amazing that they found the wreckage and it's you know it's kind of it's very rare when you come upon stuff like that you know to this day we're still hearing about stories of people finding of people finding planes and and other ships uh you know, to this day. So it's, it was actually really cool. It's a really great documentary to watch. I really highly suggest it. And it's amazing what Paul Allen does for the uh, World War II community and the preservation. He, uh, you know, rest in peace, Paul Allen. He has a museum up in Seattle called the uh, Heritage um, Museum. He has a huge collection. Unfortunately, it closed down due to COVID and some of the collection was sold off, but it the museum did reopen. So no, and we, sorry, uh, that has nothing to do with the indie. But... No, no, but I, that's <laughs> one point. I did that wonderful show with Jennifer a few months ago about her diving off Saipan, and she gave me a, a, a whole lot of contacts of people who do underwater archaeology. And at some point in the future, I'm going to do at least a week or maybe two weeks of, of programming on the channel about archaeology, marine archaeology, and also a week about battlefield archaeology, ground archaeology, because it's a fascinating uh, subject. We did one with uh, uh, Dennis a few weeks ago about uh, in, in Normandy, where he, uh, a, rel a bracelet of a Canadian soldier was found, and the technology that has allowed information to be in, uh, ga gained from sites that otherwise we wouldn't have got the information from. It's incredible the last couple of decades with ground penetrating radar and the fact you can send cameras and ships down to this depth now and get information is, 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 is incredible. Um, so, um, yeah, no, that's, that's remarkable. They found it after all these years. Yeah. Well, I'm shocked. I mean, if, if, if people go and look at the pictures of the videos, how, even though the Indy did explode and almost tear in half, um, how intact she is, is insane. Like it's, <laughs> it's insane and it's um it, it's really cool to see um and i'm you know the the survivors there's only one survivor of the uss indianapolis who is still alive um unfortunately i don't i can't remember the name his name off the top of my head but um when they discovered the indy um a lot of the men the veterans of the indy were super happy and um were very ecstatic about that so wow amazing story mm -hmm. moving on next one yes so um those were the my 10 interesting facts, but I wanted to share with you guys some great uh, documentaries, movies, books about the USS Indianapolis. So this is the USS Indianapolis, The Legacy. This is a film by Sarah Vladek. Um, this film took 10 years to make, and she interviews the veterans of the USS Indianapolis. It is available on Prime to watch. Um, it is, I'm giving myself goosebumps. I watched it again last, I've seen it so many times. I've watched it again last night, but you hear these first account stories of what happened um, with the men of the USS Indianapolis and everything from uh, 
them battling in the Pacific to the sinking, to the rescue, and then the aftermath of what they're doing today. And it's truly a really great documentary. So I highly suggest it. It's called the USS Indianapolis, The Legacy. You can watch it on Amazon Prime. Brilliant. <clears throat> and then we can go to the next slide. Will do. Okay, two books, which are amazing. So I own <laughs> both of these. Um, so In Harm's Way by Doug Stanton. Um, this is actually the book that got me hooked on the USS Indianapolis. My mom actually bought it for me at Goodwill for $3.99, and I couldn't put it down. And um, it's by Doug Stanton, who is a really great, um, really great author. He actually just came out with a second version of In Harm's Way with more stuff added. I don't know if anything else has been edited, but that just came out this uh, past year, I believe. Okay. And then we have Indianapolis, which is by Lynn Vincent and then Sarah Vladek, who did the oh, USS Lindsay. Indianapolis uh, documentary. She is a, a professional historian for the USS Indianapolis. So, and, and what, what, how much, are, just for those who haven't read them, how much of those books um, focuses on the tragic chapter and how much focuses on the incredible history? Because as you said at the beginning, it, you know, it, the ship had an extraordinary history. So I'm, yes. I'm hoping it's, it's covering the whole lot or they're covering the whole lot. It is. So, so Doug, Doug Stanton's book goes a little bit more into focusing on the sinking and, and, and all of that right. stuff that happens. Sarah Vladek and uh, Lynn Vincent's book goes into like everything. So like command and all that stuff. Doug Stanton touches on that too, but I, I feel like uh, Sarah Vladek's book was a little bit more, um, not, not re reference is not the, the word I want to Comprehensive say. maybe? Co comprehensive. It, it got a little bit more statistical. Okay. Data. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, those are the two really great books on the Indianapolis. There's also a another book too but i don't i don't own it and i can't think of it was the first book written about the uss indianapolis but i can't think of it off the top of my head but okay and great can, and we can do the next slide okay <laughs> if any of my followers are watching they're gonna laugh at this <laughs> so there are two movies about the uss indianapolis one is extremely awful and the other one is really great um the first movie that I'm going to talk about is the USS Indianapolis Men of Courage starring Nicolas Cage as Captain McVay. Um, it is a really bad movie. It's really bad. I mean, it, is, it, is. it is. I mean, it is really bad. There are historical inaccuracies. Um, the CGI is awful. Nicolas Cage as Captain McVay was one of the worst choices I have ever seen. And the thing is that movie could have been so, so fantastic. I watched it again. I, I watched it again last night, got 20 minutes into it. And I just, I just couldn't. Um, it, I mean, the, what, I think one thing that makes me upset about it is that a lot of people will watch movies based on something and they'll get them interested in it. <laughs> I would be so upset if somebody like thought that all the stuff in that movie was completely accurate if, if you and, like, and that went movie off that. And you're inspired to do anything other than jump out of a window. I, I would be very surprised. I mean, it, it's the kind of movie that puts you off movies and history and living. In fact, so I'm, it's just dreadful. I mean, I, you know. And Tom Hack, Nicholas Cage, Tom Sizemore, they they they're capable of being good in war films, but yeah, it's dreadful. Yeah, it's but the, yeah, Nicholas Cage, no, not in that. They, and you know, they made one part in the movie, the, the rescue scene with Adrian Marks and and Chuck Wilbur. They just made it so like star spangle, like, like, I don't know, like they were on this like Rambo mission or whatever that it was just, it was so inaccurate and it just, uh, yeah. So that's, um, one in USS Indianapolis movie, but yeah. the good USS Indianapolis movie is called, uh, mission of the Sh mission of the shark, the, the, uh, saga of the USS Indianapolis, which came out in 1991. It stars Stacy Keach as captain McVeigh. Um, it also has uh, Richard Thomas, which if you guys have ever watched the John Boy, <laughs> John Boy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> I love John Boy. Um, it's yeah, it's a made-for-TV movie. Again, it came out in '91, so it's not the best, and in, in, you know that type of stuff. But um, it's one of the it's one of the best movies on the US, um, the USS Indianapolis. The accuracy with everything. Stacy Keach as McVeigh was like perfect. Like I mean, perfect. Yeah. Absolutely perfect. Um, you can watch that on, if you guys have Tubi, 
T-U-B-I. Um, it's available on Tubi with ads, but right now. But a uh, really good movie, too, about the USS. I, I remember seeing that, and I, if I remember correctly, it was on, and I was waiting for a football match to start, and I ended up, I was going to watch just half an hour movie, then switch over to the football. But the movie was so good, I didn't switch back to the football. So that's um, <laughs> yeah. been, what, 20, 23 or something. I mean, that that's how I remember it. And, uh, uh, I, yeah, it's, it's it's a really good movie. And, um, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, no, I, I can recommend it heartily. So, and I think that's, I think that was my last clip. Apart from some from questions, hopefully. Yeah. So my <laughs> so my I'll start off with a question and we'll hope you have something from the viewers there. Um the first one is obviously you said you got that present the book as a present from your mum from Goodwill there, but what is it about the, the story of this ship that 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 floats your boat? Pardon the the pun, isn't it? Because I, you know, you know. read about paratroopers and marines in the Pacific. What is it that that you find just tantalizingly um addictive about that ship? So when I read In Harm's Way and I was reading, whenever you get really deep into what the survivors went through and what the men of the ship went through, and and then also all of the negligence and what led up to that and how it could have been avoidable, because the USS Indianapolis is one of the greatest naval disasters, yeah. one of the greatest disasters in military history. I just needed to reiterate that because every time I say that, people go, it's not the greatest one. I said, it's one of one the of, yeah. greatest. It how, yeah. how you rate the loss of yeah. life. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And so, so it's one of the greatest. Um, it was also one of the, the greatest shark attacks in history too. But just reading and researching all the stuff that like went up to it and how it sank. And then the aftermath, like of captain mcveigh and the politics of everything and just what these men went through i don't know it just it grabbed me i don't have a complete 100 percent answer but i read that book so fast that i had to read it again (laughs) i guess i i was like i know i missed some stuff and then that's just kind of where it's where it started no, definitely, I agree. And it's the fact that it's it's unsatisfying in that there is this injustice there. There's there's mm-hmm. some military books you read, and I you know I follow you on Instagram. When you, when you buy a new book, and I go, oh, that's a good one. Or there's one you <laughs> you buy I haven't got. But sometimes mm-hmm. you 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 put a military book down with that kind of resounding thump on the shelf and go, yep, learn from that, and you have that sort of sense of self satisfaction. Whenever mm-hmm. I read about this ship, I just come away with this frustration that uh, the tragic, the hu- the loss of life in this tragic, uh, tragic story, the injustice that we may face. The, the it, it leaves me. I want to know more, but it leaves me frus- frustrated. Um, I it think does. Is, it, is it leaves you frustrated, and then it just you know the the aftermath of everything after McVeigh, you know, thirty two years after his death, and. Um, uh, he finally got exonerated thanks to a 12 year old boy named Hunter Scott in his eighth, in his eighth grade history project. Like it, and it just, <laughs> well, you have to elaborate on that now. You can't just drop that and then, then not Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. So <laughs> Captain McVeigh was, you know, he was convicted of failing to zigzag, yeah. um, in 2000, Bill Clinton signed in, uh, to Congress, uh, the exoneration of Captain McVeigh. Um, and that happened because a 12 year old Hunter Scott was doing his history research project. Um, I can't remember the specific, um, name of, it was like history, uh, not history across America, but something like that. It was this big eighth grade history project and he did it on the USS Indianapolis and he ended up going through about 800 documents. He interviewed veterans. He did all of this stuff. And all of a sudden he was like, oh crap this guy was wrongly convicted. Like this 12 year old kids like this, Captain McVeigh was wrongly convicted. He needs to be exonerated. And so he started on a mission to get that done. And it went through uh, all of these channels. And then finally in 2000, uh, October 25th of 2000, he was exonerated. Um, And uh, Commander Hashimoto, who had been Mm -hmm. advocating for him for years after uh, after the trial and the conviction and everything, he did not think Captain McVeigh deserved that at all. Um, he passed away five days before he was able to see the um, document signed for wow. his exoneration. Mm-hmm. Well, the History Underground is saying who who teaches people of that age, wait, what, an eighth grader? So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and and that that's just a movie in its own right. Someone said that's, you know, that, that Lorelei said that's a movie in its own right. There's a fantastic movie, a 12 year old history project exonerates McVeigh. I mean, that, there you are. So, yeah. Uh, well, we've had one question so far uh, from Bruce. He's saying, how long had McVeigh been captain of the Indy when she sank? Oh, gosh. Um, he wasn't captain that long. Um, of course, it's not in my notes. 
Do you know? I can't think of it off the top of my head, I, I but I think it was. I think it was a less. I think it was. It was less than a year. Yeah, it was not that. It was. It was not that year. long. Yeah, I want to say it was. It was about like four months or something like that. But I could be wrong. I'm just trying to go off the top of my head. But yeah, it was. Yeah. It was less. It was less than a year. Yeah, no, definitely. And people are talking about the fact that 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 I should get find this twelve year old boy who I'm guessing now is if that was two thousand, he's twenty something. I don't know, but I could find him and get him on the show there. Um, so um, I think well, there are no more questions coming in. Oh, hang on, here we go. Uh, Lord, Lord Lloyd, was it sheer bad luck the Indy crossed the path of the submarine traveling at speed? She would have been a difficult target if not unlucky. So, uh, so was it? There is an element of bad luck, but what's your take on that? So, I don't think it... yes and no. Um, command was actually tracking the I fifty eight um, before the Indy left uh, from from Guam, um, so they knew she was in the water. Um, and it actually kind of is just luck too, because when the I-58 spotted the Indy, he didn't, they didn't know it was Indy. They just thought it was, uh, they thought it was the USS, either uh, USS New Mexico, I think it was, um, is or Idaho is what they thought it was. Um, so they had no idea it was the Indy. So I do think it was a little bit of bad luck. Um, but also I think that if command had taken uh, and intelligence had taken it more seriously of, all the pass that the I-58 was doing, because they were intercepting messages from the I-58. And one of the messages actually was, went after the Indy sank, they sent out a message saying, ship sank, you know, like we sunk a ship. Um, so I think it is a little bit of bad luck, but also it was something that it was definitely avoidable. No, definitely, but it's that complacency issue again, isn't it? You know, there's that, yes, the back of the Japanese submarine threat has been broken there are a lot less submarines than there were three years earlier but they're still they're still dangerous it's that it's that analogy of the of the the wounded beast isn't it japan is now the the wounded animal that is going to bite back if you're in the wrong place and in, in this era yeah clearly of course the tide is turning in favor of the allies and the war is is going to be over fairly soon but a, a submarine out like that can still as we now find no can um could cause utter tragedy so um and another question from Phil is, uh, when can Sarah come back on again? So that's an interesting <laughs> we can think of something to talk about, I suppose. We'll see after this if Paul, actually, if Paul wants me back. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm happy to have people on. And it's, 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 you know, as I said, I admire what you're doing in terms of bringing history to people from a slightly different direction because there are lots of stuffy middle-aged white guys talking about history and I can't help being a stuffy middle-aged middle -aged white guy but it's <laughs> good that there are people outside that demographic I've got Liberty Phillips Phillips coming on on Wednesday talking about the wonderful work she does and she's a kick-ass girl who jumps out of C-47s and works with dementia sufferers and what she does in World War II has been, has been is amazing so she's coming on so there we are um, one question from JD. So you've interviewed JD for your channel. So history under yeah, Afghanistan. Yeah. Has studying the history of the Indianapolis led you to any other specific topics in the Pacific or other ways that become an obsession? So has your one addiction become a second <laughs> addiction? Is Indianapolis the entry level drug? And have you moved up now? <laughs> I um Pacific wise, um I the Indies like my thing. I do have other obsessions in in like the European theater and stuff like that. But um, not so. Much, um, it is definitely the Indianapolis. At the time I started reading about the Indianapolis um, in harm's way and stuff like that, I really wasn't into the Pacific theater at that time. I really wasn't into the naval part of it. Um, my opa was in the Fourth Armored Division, so I'd always been focused on the European right. theater and the the army. Um, so this actually opened a whole new pathway of of becoming obsessed with ships and the battles in the Pacific and and that type of stuff. So it it, it was the book and the indie got me one hundred percent into the Pacific. That's the Pacific theater that because I've found recently that I'm getting quite a few people commenting on the show saying they weren't interested in the Pacific for sometimes decades. These sometimes these are these are people older than me who've never never been interested in it. And then there's that one little story that they read about or hear about on on YouTube or a podcast, and they and they start showing interest. And I think mm -hmm. if, if a bit of advice for anybody out there that has a theater or a war they're interested in and they kind of are worried about breaking out, is that when you look at another subject, it can seem overwhelming. You know, if you start I'm going to start learning about the American Civil War. And you look at how many hundreds of books there are and you go, okay, I'm not going to start that. <laughs> yeah. Or the Pacific, you know, you, 
you know, where do you start? But I think the advice you would give and I would give is start with a, a sort of a self-contained story that has a human level of interest and then yes. kind of branch outwards. So whether that's focused on one battle or one or somebody's biography, you know, biography, like their journey in the war um, is what I suggest when starting out, when learning a whole different conflict. <clears throat> and I think most people uh, lean towards the European theater versus the Pacific theater because um, we have so many more movies and TV shows made about the European theater, not so much about the Pacific. We don't have much uh, stuff about that. And also, I think people, you know, lean towards the whatever their relatives um, served in. So if your relatives served in the Pacific, you're gonna have people who are much more interested in the Pacific and, and vice versa. I think you also get an element of a happy ending in the ETO in that you do get liberated yeah. cities. You get grateful civilians coming out, throwing bunches of flowers, at allied soldiers. Okay, there's the, the, the offset of that is the liberation of the death camps and the concentration camps, which of course is a, is a massive volume of tragedy, but there is, when you speak to ETO veterans, they will most of them have some kind of memory of of meeting grateful civilians and feeling some sense of it being worthwhile. Whereas Pacific veterans, it's just tragedy after tragedy and human. There's not much. There's not much to come out of that, that feeling of uh If you if you've survived mm -hmm. Burma or the Pacific, you just come out of it exhausted and like oh, there's no there's no there's no proverbial ticker tape parade, which I think makes it harder for people to access. Well, I think because the I'm not saying that one theater was more was more significant than the other, but the, they were two completely different conflicts um, and styles of war. Um, in the European theater, you could take a weekend pass and go to Paris. In yeah. the Pacific, you were stuck on an island. Like you, there was you couldn't go anywhere. You were you're trapped in, and it was just it was such a different dynamic in each theater, and it was. Um, so I, I see what you're saying, but it's just yeah. It's no, definitely. And, and it, 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 you know, as you were saying there, the different wars. And JD is saying with the old breed was his gateway drug for interest in the Pacific theater. And it's yeah. another question that we could bring up is, and you, you've talked to some of the actors and, you know, you've got your connection with Band of Brothers yourself, is that the reaction to Band of Brothers, the TV show, very different generally to the reaction to the Pacific. They're, they're, they're yes. essentially the similar 10 episodes telling the stories of, of groups mm -hmm. of men in combat. But the the, re the public reaction to the series is, is tends to be very different. And, and Pacific, I find, is much more of a slow burn. I'm, I'm finding people who didn't like it at the beginning, and now, 20 years on, they're starting to appreciate it. Whereas Band of Brothers, people have this sort of comfy old sweater affection for Band of Brothers yeah. that, that they don't have for the Pacifics. And I think that kind of symbolizes that a lot of people's understanding and comprehension of those two theaters. Yeah, well, I mean, Band of Brothers is like excuse me, frog in my throat. <clears throat> um, it's, it's the OG. It was the first, you know, Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks series that we got. We got to, you know, learn about Easy Company and everything. It came right after Saving Private Ryan. So people were kind of on still that Saving Private Ryan, Ryan high. Um, but so when people think just like it's going to happen with Masters of the Air when it comes out, people are going to compare Masters of the Air to Band of Brothers or to the Pacific. And they're, it's, it's going to be the <laughs> same type of thing. People do need to realize that they're uh, two completely different books. They're two completely different stories. Um, and I think people love Band of Brothers so much because you're following one company and you're seeing all of the development of them and, yeah. and, and it, it's more of a, of a personal uh, personal growth. And then you also see the battle of war with the Pacific. You're following you know different Marine divisions around and um, it's a little bit more gnarly i guess you know Good uh, word. yeah uh, gnarly battle wise um not again not saying that the men in you know the european theater but it was again a diff totally different um enemy they were fighting you know they were fighting the japanese not the not the the nazis so yeah um people just i think people were just expecting a second band of brothers just the just the pacific version but yeah. um yeah, I, I, we're going it, down a rabbit hole, but I think you're, you're right there. Oh yeah, sorry. The brothers came out. We we had no expectation because it kind of took not took us by surprise, but most of us hadn't been following its production and we hadn't really been 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 invested in it before it hit our screens. And then it was like wow, and, and we all know, of course, the timing of it hitting in the U.S. right at the time of 9/11. Whereas 9 the Pacific, 
we all watched it go through development. We we were we we were all waiting for our fo our difficult follow up. The album anticipation, the yeah. And 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 the master of the air is suffering even greater than that because we've been waiting for a decade now. And, and oh, I know. And I still don't know when it's actually going to be released. Is it September? Is it October? Is it next year? No, I think it's next. I think it got pushed to next year. Wow. So so we're all going to be sitting there, kind of very arms folded anticipating it to be the greatest tv show of all time and i i can mm -hmm. i feel for john orloff and the writers yeah. in the cast because there's a huge expectancy on them uh, yeah. to, to, to knock it out of the park i'm sure it'll be brilliant i'm sure after that amount of effort it's going to be really good but i think people will be going in it's like we're going down a massive rabbit it's like all the star wars things now people are going into it with such high levels of expectations mm -hmm. they want it to be everything that it was to them when they were kids they wanted to be everything to everybody and of course you end up being somewhat disappointed so i yeah, we've gone down a bit of a tangent there, but it's great. Um, <laughs> Bruce, one last question. Bruce Day is saying, Sarah, what's on the cap you're wearing? Oh, this is my um, history chick logo. <laughs> there we are. I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we will leave it at that. So, Sarah, good luck with the channel. Again, the links to your channels are in the description below, folks. If you're not following uh, Sarah on Instagram and elsewhere, then, then rectify that immediately. And we will put our heads together and think about another thing you can come and talk about uh, because it's been great talking to you. Yeah, Paul, thanks so much for having me on. It's been such a pleasure. So Great. We'll see you next time. So cheers, everybody. I will see you again tomorrow on World War II TV. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Cheers, everybody. Bye.